Okay, I think we're about ready to begin. This is the final class, I believe. So hold back your tears. Um, a couple of announcements you've probably heard before, but please turn off your cell phones or put them on silent mode during class. If you have questions, we have a microphone over here. There's a little square you stand on or a little X on the floor and don't touch the mic, but you can ask questions. If you are online and want to ask questions, you can email them to lifelonglearning at wichita.edu. Uh, this is a two-hour lecture. We'll take a break somewhere in the neighborhood of halfway through, about 10 minutes or so. And um, per latest university guideline, Students and visitors must wear face coverings over their mouths and noses while on all Wichita State University campuses and all hallways, public spaces, classrooms, and other common areas of campus buildings. Um, if you have a condition that prohibits you from wearing a mask, that's okay. All right, so today, um, the agenda is to talk about the beginnings of what is termed the modern jazz movement, which is going to be start with the bebop era about in the early to mid 40s. And we're probably going to look at jazz music throughout the 50s. I doubt we'll get time for the 60s and 70s, but that might be okay because part of the purpose of this class is just to give you a a basic understanding of the music so that if you go out into Wichita and you hear a concert, whether it be at a university or at a club or a restaurant or something like that, you'll have uh, some basic knowledge about how it works. And frankly, most of the time we're going to be talking about music from the 50s. Uh, most of the groups I play with uh, when we play jazz, I would say that's probably the style we're playing is 50s jazz. Um, 60s jazz, the 60s, are it's actually one of my favorite eras of jazz, but it is a bit of an acquired taste. A lot of it is very avant-garde and experimental. Um, you won't hear any of that at a restaurant. However... I have supplied you with a listening list that covers some of the music of the 60s and the 70s. And if you are so curious, so interested, you can kind of check some of that out. There's some really interesting stuff there. And of course, the 70s was also when jazz sort of combined with rock to create what's often referred to as fusion or jazz fusion or jazz rock fusion. I've heard all of those terms. And I've put some examples of that on the listening list as well. So to begin with today, um, if you recall, when we left last time, we had just listened to a, a very uh, interesting, I don't know what the word would be, but we listened to sort of more of an avant-garde big band piece. And think of this as a palate cleanser from that time. We're going to listen to some songs uh, by a few of my favorite singers. If your favorite singer is not on here, I'm sorry. Um, there's just no time to, to check out everyone. Um, and in so doing, I'm kind of hopefully giving you a little bit of a refresher on the history of the big band sound. Most all, yes, all of these singers that we're going to listen to, four of them in total, got their start with big bands. It will start with Bing Crosby in 1931. Um, so this was kind of before the swing era was established. This was when New York jazz was popular and we'd sort of moved away from the New Orleans sound. Um, Bing Crosby, I think he was from... Washington State, if I remember correctly. Um, he actually 
got his big break with the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, which you may remember was um, one of the early important New York groups that initially played a sort of um, music that was jazz-like but did not feature any improvisation. And then later on, as jazz got more popular, he would hire uh, specific musicians that could come in and improvise within the group. Um, Bing Crosby would go on to be one of the, the first kind of superstars of the 20th century. Um, he had a huge hit in 1941 with uh, White Christmas. Um, he went on um, to become a, a very famous actor as well. I'm sure you know this fellow. But I thought we would listen to this song called Out of Nowhere. And uh, also, by means of refresher, this is a song that follows the good old Tin Pan Alley song form. It's an A-B-A-C structure. Each of those sections is eight bars, and I've even, I don't know how well you can see it, but I've put the lead sheet. This is the lead sheet where, I mean, I have this song memorized, but, if, but back in my younger days, I did not know this song, so I would take this music to a gig and I would read off of it. And this is exactly the sheet that I would use. But let's give this a listen. Little introduction up front. When you start singing, that's the beginning of the form. You came to me from out of nowhere You took my heart And found it free Wonderful dreams Wonderful schemes From nowhere Made every hour Sweet as a flower to me And if you should go Back to your nowhere Leaving me with A memory I'll always wait For your return Out of nowhere Hoping you'll bring your love To me When I least expected, kindly fate directed you to make each dream of mine come true. And if it's clear or raining, there is no explaining. Things just happen, and so did you. You came to me from out of nowhere. You took my heart and you found it free. Wonderful dreams, wonderful schemes from nowhere made every hour. Sweet as a flower to me And if you should go Back to your nowhere Leaving me with With my memory I'll always wait For your return Out of nowhere Hoping you'll bring your love to me. Yes, so um, not really much jazz improvisation or anything like that in there. That was, a, I think, a really good example of what popular songs sounded like back then. Out of Nowhere, by the way, is a jazz standard which is still played to this day um most gigs i play i play this tune it's it's one of my favorites 
Um, going on, Ella Fitzgerald uh, from Virginia, I believe. Uh, she is one of my favorites. Um, grew up very poor. In fact, one of her jobs as a child was really to run errands uh, for a bordello, which was also something she had in common with uh, Billie Holiday, who we're going to look at next. Um, but she was a great singer and a dancer as a child, and the, the story goes is that she went uh, to an amateur night at the Apollo Theater and was meaning to do a dance number, but right before her, there, were, there was a local dance couple that did an amazing job, and so she decided at the last minute she would sing, and she won first place. And that was sort of the beginning of her career. She also got her start during the big band era where she uh, sang initially with Chick Webb's orchestra. And Chick Webb is a very famous drummer of that era. Um, and this song, A Tisket, A Tasket, which is really just a nursery rhyme, became a huge hit for them. And it was really the song that put Ella Fitzgerald on the map in 1938. Ella Fitzgerald is just, she's known for her <laughs> extreme accuracy and purity of voice. And she also became known as an excellent scat singer. Um, she listened to a lot of Louis Armstrong records when she was young and um, actually ended up recording some very famous records with him uh, later on in her career. But we'll listen to this one, and then I'd like to play a song afterwards that will showcase her scat singing style. So here's a tisket a tasket. Notice the Kansas City opening. The boogie woogie. A tisket a tasket. A brown and yellow basket I send a letter to my mommy On the way I dropped it I dropped it, I dropped it Yes, on the way I dropped it A little girly picked it up And put it in her pocket She was trucking on down the avenue But not a single thing to do She went peck, peck, pecking all around when she spied it on the ground, she took it, she took it, my little yellow basket. And if she doesn't bring it back, I think that I will die. A tisket, a tasket, I lost my yellow basket. And if that girly don't return it, don't know what I'll do. Oh dear, I wonder where my basket can be. listen to Blue Skies next. This was recorded in the late 50s. By the way, some of her most important recordings are uh, often dubbed the songbook recordings, where she would take a um, specific famous Tin Pan Alley composer such as Cole Porter or uh, Gershwin and 
uh, put out an album where she would just sing those tunes. They're all fantastic, and you can listen to them on YouTube or you can purchase them or whatever. I would strongly recommend listening to those. So Blue Skies, we already uh, last week listened to a version of Benny Goodman doing this, the famous Irving Berlin song. And so um, now we're going to listen to this one. And like I said, a great scat solo in the middle. Um, listen for the, she even quotes Rhapsody in Blue, the, the famous melody by Gershwin. Um, if you know that melody, listen for it. Blue skies smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see. Blue birds singing a song, nothing but blue birds all day long. Never saw the sun shining so bright, never saw things going so right. Noticing the days hurrying by, when you're in love, my, how they fly. Blue days, all of them gone, nothing but blue skies from now on. So 1958 is obviously a little later than the swing era, and it turns out that style of scat singing really probably wouldn't have been possible without bebop, because a lot of the singers took their cues from bebop, which we will talk about soon. Just a couple more songs. I'd like to play uh, one of Billie Holiday's most famous songs. Um, this is 1941, so we're definitely still in the swing era here. 
Uh, God bless the child is is one of her big ones. Um, I guess the story goes she was having an argument with her mother because she needed some money and her mother didn't want to give it to her and said to Billie Holiday, God, ple- God bless the child who has his own. And she, that sort of uh, spurred her on to write this song. It's a tune that lots of jazz players still play to this day. Let's give a listen to this. Them that's God shall get, them that's not shall lose. So the Bible said, and it still is new. Mama may have, Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Yes, the strong gets more while the weak ones fade. Empty pockets don't ever make the grade. Mama may have, Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Yeah, so that's one of the great things about jazz is that um, you can have two people that sing as different as Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday. They were contemporaries, and in fact, they often found themselves, um, uh, oh, fighting's not the right word, but they were always in competition with each other. Um, They ended up becoming pretty good friends. Um, Billie Holiday... Uh, her youth is, it's just awful. She had a terrible childhood. Um, and she ended up in her later years becoming addicted to heroin. And her story is very sad. But the music that she left us with is is just transcendent, really. Um, she actually worked with Count Basie's band in the late 30s. She was notoriously sort of hot-headed and temperamental, and although there's not been a very good reason given why she left that band, that was one of the reasons, and apparently she didn't think she was getting paid enough. She then went on to work uh, with Artie Shaw's big band. Artie Shaw was uh, a direct competitor to Benny Goodman back during the swing era, and... um, 
so Billie Holiday, Artie Shaw's band was all white. So this was one of the first, maybe not the first, but one of the first instances where an African-American singer sang with an all-white big band. Um, so the last thing that I want to play for you is just some Frank Sinatra. We already listened a little bit to um, Frank Sinatra. I think we listened to one of his early songs with the Dorsey brothers in, during the, uh, uh, the big band era, the swing era. So this is sort of more uh, mature Frank Sinatra, and this was during one of his uh, many collaborations with the Count Basie Orchestra. This is from one of his most famous albums, a uh, residency he did um, at a club in Las Vegas. Uh, I think it's called Sinatra at the Sands. Uh, I think that's the name of the album. And uh, this was his opener. It was one of his favorite songs. So this will be the last thing we listen to with singers. And then we'll get to modern jazz. The Sands is proud to present a wonderful new show, A Man and His Music. The music of Count Basie and his great band... And the man is Frank Sinatra. How did all these people get in my room? Come fly with me, we'll fly, we'll fly away. If you can use some exotic booze, there's a bar in far Bombay. Come on, fly with me, we'll fly, we'll fly away. Come fly with me, we'll float down to Peru. In Lama Land, there's a one-man band, and he'll toot his flute for you. Come on, fly with me, we'll float down in the blue. Once I get you up there, where the air is rarefied, we'll just glide, starry eye. Once I get you up there, I'll be holding you so near. You might hear all the angels cheer because we're together. Weather-wise, it's such a lovely day. Just say those words, we'll beat those birds down to Acapulco Bay. It is perfect for a flying honeymoon, they say. Come on, fly with me, we'll fly, we'll fly, we'll fly. Once I get you up there Where the air is so rarefied We're gonna glide Absolutely petrified Once I get you up there I'll be holding you So awfully near You might even hear A gang of angels cheer Just because we're together Weather-wise It's such a groovy day You just say that word And I'll beat your bird Down to Acapulco Bay is perfect for a flying honeymoon and they do say come on fly with me we'll fly we'll fly Don't tell your 
Oh, Papa. Okay. So, um, now we're going to talk about modern jazz. And I'm kind of glad we had that little bit of time to listen to some singers from the big band era because I think the contrast will be set a bit better. So, bebop, that was the music that followed the swing era. Um, I have these dates down here, 1942 to 1949, very loose. Don't get too worried about that. Um, the first thing I want to do is just play you a pretty famous tune, a bebop tune, and then I'll kind of talk about it. So um, the personnel in this group, Dizzy Gillespie, we already talked about a little bit last time. Um, Charlie Parker was like the god of the bebop movement. And um, the rest of the players in this group, also on a lot of recordings from this era. So this is a song called Salt Peanuts. Let's give it a listen. <laughs> Hopefully that sounds a little different than swing music, but why? What is similar? What is different? And why did it happen? Okay, so here are some things that maybe you should know about bebop music. Um, to begin with, before I get into some of this, 
uh, one of the the cruel truths about the history of jazz is that bebop actually was invented during a time where there were no recordings being made. In 1942 to about 1944, there was a musicians' union strike, and it had a it had a lot to do with like how musicians were paid um, for the music recording. So the entire time that bebop was coming together, we, we really don't have anything, no, no sort of transitional recordings that we can refer to. Um, one of the earliest recordings we have that they recently just discovered in the last decade or so, maybe, was there was a uh, concert that Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie gave in 1945, and they just found the recording, and it, it's awesome. Uh, they released it, oh, I can't remember, it was in maybe 2011 or something like that. But 1945 was about when we got the first recordings of bebop. And by that time, the musicians knew what they were doing. And so we get the mature bebop style right out of the gate. Bebop music was basically created by the sidemen, by the players in big bands. So what would happen is the big bands would go on the road or they would do shows. And then after hours, the musicians would get together and they would jam. This is almost in a way similar to uh, the way that Kansas City jazz sort of got its beginning too, because there was a lot of that same jamming around to get the ideas. And in fact, bebop, I think it can be seen as sort of a continuation of Kansas City jazz. Remember that a couple of the things that Kansas City jazz brought to the table was um, the dominance of the walking bass line and the move of the timekeeping from the bass drum and the snare to the cymbals. And you could hear that in that last song for the most part. So also bebop started when jazz music was declining. Um, I had mentioned that because of some of the things that were happening in the 40s, that uh, swing music began to die out. Like some of it was that it was harder to get instruments, that musicians were conscripted into the army. Um, there was uh, a, a reduction in uh, resources, so there weren't as many vinyl records made. Um, it became harder for big bands to go out on the road then. Um, because tires were harder to get, because you needed that rubber for the war effort. And besides that, the music had sort of, like all styles, eventually become repetitive. So before rock music, before Elvis came along to replace it, jazz was already sort of declining. And uh, the bebop musicians, I don't know if they, if it's fair to say they didn't really care. They were kind of in their own thing trying to put together this music. So what were some of the uh, characteristics of this sound? Well, uh, let's see here. First of all, the thing that sort of overrides the whole thing is the bebop musicians were not interested in... Um, being popular. They felt that this music should be an art form, and that's the way they viewed it, and that's how they stuck to it. So this was in itself a sea change, because before then, jazz music was for dancing. Now bebop was less of a music for dancing and became more of a music that you would go to a club and you would listen to. Part of why it was hard to dance to it is because the tempos became more extreme. As you heard, that song kind of cooked along pretty fast, and that wasn't even the fastest bebop song. The tempos would become very, very fast, and sometimes when they played ballads, they would become very, very slow. So it became a lot harder 
to play over this music. And in, in fact, one of the things that happened in bebop is um, these were always around, but they were called cutting sessions. So you would have a jam session, but part of the deal with the jam session was to come in and see if you could actually make the cut, if you could play this music. So you would get on the bandstand and they would like count off a song at a ridiculously fast tempo. And if you couldn't play it, you were laughed off the bandstand. Um, in fact, this happened to both Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and uh, caused them to go to the woodshed, which is another jazz term, which means that you go and you practice. Um, Charlie Parker in an interview said that at one time he was practicing eight hours a day. So, the music became faster. You could especially hear in Charlie Parker's solo that the lines became longer. What I mean by that is that you would get a long series of fluid notes with no stopping or breathing in between them. It's very different than the sort of soloing that happened during the swing era, where it was more overtly melodic, more based on uh, riffs and blues and melodic figures. Oftentimes the arrangements were very simple. The song we just listened to was kind of complicated, but most of the time, one of the things that Bebop did was it kept the blues form and the song form. But when they played the melodies, they would often be highly simplified. So instead of the thing with uh, swing and big band music where you might get like a whole section playing harmonized melodies, the block chords, in big band music, most of the time when a melody was played, all of the horns would just play the same line, the same pitch level. Uh, this is called, uh, you can see in that uh, first bullet point, melodies were presented monophonically. That's what I mean by that, is they just all played the same melody. The harmonies, chord progressions, and melodies became much more complex. This is a bit more of a technical issue, but I will tell you that when you go to school, or when I went to school anyway, to learn about jazz, this was like one of the places that you really had to spend a lot of time on, was learning how to play what's called the bebop language. In in a similar way that if you were a classical musician, you would work on the music of Bach and Beethoven and Brahms and maybe not go back and learn the music that came before it, like Renaissance music, for example. Um, when you learn jazz at college, there's really not a whole lot of time spent on Dixieland or swing music. All of the music that you learn is based on bebop. And all of the music that came after it is based on the characteristics of the be bebop language. It's one of the reasons it's called modern jazz, because musicians today are still learning how to play this music. The instrumentation was mostly, most of the recordings were just a combo setting. So we've gone from the big band, which at this point was... It was really hard for big bands to get work, so because who wanted to pay for a big band? Um, so the groups were pared down to become combos. String bass, drums, piano, and then usually a frontline horn section. Now the thing about bebop is that the solo became the important part. The song was not near as important. It was just the window dressing that the solos would occur in. In fact, um, about this time in the late 40s was when you could actually, apparently, you could get sort of portable or semi-portable reel-to-reel -reel players, and you could go to a gig and you could record a performance. If, if you were a regular person, you could do this. And I actually have um, a couple of CDs from this era where some guy went to the jazz clubs in New York and went to a Charlie Parker gig and he recorded none of the song. All he did was hit record when Charlie Parker would solo and then he would hit stop when it was done. 
And so I have a CD of this that that's all it is, is Charlie Parker solos. That's how important the solo was to the music. One of the things also that Beboppers did, um, by the way, it was called Bebop. The, the, uh, the musicians that played this music did not call it Bebop. It was another thing that was used as sort of a marketing gimmick. And it was just kind of a nonsense word that when you jazz scat, that might be something that you would sing as Bebop. So that's why the music is called what it is. Um, one of the things that happened in bebop was that the jazz musicians would write what are called contrafacts. Now, a contrafact is when you take an existing song, like a Tin Pan Alley tune or something like that, something that was written for a musical or a movie, and you would keep the chord progression, but you would write a brand new melody over the top of it. And a lot of bebop tunes were contrafacts. Some of them were original pieces of music, but a, I would almost say the majority of them were contrafacts. A good number of them were. And one of the chord progressions that bebop players loved the most was this song, I Got Rhythm by George Gershwin. And they loved to solo over this chord progression. And so there are... I would say there's probably hundreds of contrafacts of using the chords to this song and then writing new melodies over it. So what I'd like to do is play this original version, and then I'd like to play a Charlie Parker contrafact over this. And we'll see if you can tell the similarities. <laughs> This is the verse of the song. Jazz musicians just don't even bother with this. The main part of the song is called the chorus. And that's what the jazz musicians were interested in. Why shouldn't we sing along? I'm chipper all the day. Happy with my lot. How do I get that way? Look at what I've got. I got rhythm. This is a chorus. Music. I got my man to ask for anything more. I got Daisy in green pasture. I got my man who could ask for anything more. An old man trouble, say I don't mind him, but you won't find him round my door. I got starlight and I got sweet dream. I got my man who could ask for anything more, who could ask for anything more. 
Okay. And I mean, the melody is great. It's really catchy and very simple. Um, now, listen to what the bebop players did to it. <laughs> Okay, so if you would have, I don't know if you were doing this, but uh, you could have like sang along in your head, I got rhythm, and it would have fit what they were playing. But you can hear that that melody is, is highly technical comparatively, uh, more snaky, a um, lot of notes, but still tuneful in its own way. Um, so Charlie Parker was definitely one of the big names of this movement, and he was a Kansan. He was born in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, and as such, he was highly influenced by the Kansas City style that was happening at that period, or the Count Basie style, I suppose you could say. Um, he, he kind of also had a rough childhood. He was brought up mostly by his mother, who was, who was kind of doting, I suppose. Um, and she bought him his first saxophone, which he, he played. But he dropped out of high school and got married and um, had a child, like, yeah, like way before he was an adult, and actually was playing music professionally by the time he was age 16. Um, he was in a car accident when he was younger and became addicted to opiates, heroin in particular. and. Charlie Parker, unfortunately, is kind of the guy that, that we have that stereotype of the musician of this period kind of being an out-of-control drug user. And it wasn't helped by the fact that he was so adored 
by his fellow musicians and by younger musicians that wanted to emulate them, that many people took up heroin just because they thought it would be, make them play like him. Um, Miles Davis famously was addicted to heroin and eventually kicked it. Charlie Parker never was able to, and when he couldn't get heroin, he would, he would drink way too much. And one of his causes of early death was advanced cirrhosis of the liver. Um, he was only 35, 34, 35 when he died, but the, um, the mortician thought that he was in his 50s. So he really did not take care of himself, unfortunately. Um, but as a professional musician, he would play in a lot of big bands, and that's where he met Dizzy Gillespie, and those two would sort of collaborate along with others to sort of develop be bebop in its early years. And it's not like they had a plan. It's just they had things they heard in their head, and they tried to make it happen. Um Famously, he ended up kind of playing with Miles Davis, who is really one of the most important figures in jazz music. Uh, Miles Davis eventually replaced Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie kind of got tired of Charlie Parker's issues. And uh, Miles Davis, who adored Charlie Parker, um, would go on to play with him. And in fact, Miles Davis's very first recordings as a leader, he had Charlie Parker on the session. Um, his biography is fascinating. There are tons of books written about Charlie Parker, and there was even one movie uh, where Forrest Whitaker played him called Bird. Uh, that was his nickname, Bird. Um, there's different stories about why that was his nickname. It was because he played like a bird in flight. Um, it was because he loved chicken. There's a story about how they were driving on a tour and he saw a chicken and made everyone stop so he could go get the chicken to eat later. So who knows? But anyway, that's the story. I'd like to play one more Charlie Parker tune. Um, this is one... This might be the earliest recording we have of Charlie Parker. And one of the reasons I wanted to play it for you is because it was recorded here in Wichita. It was broadcast um, from a Wichita radio city. It might have even been the Wichita. It might have been whatever was KMUW back at that time. Um, and it's really interesting to hear this because this band is definitely a swing era band and everyone that solos sounds like they're playing in the swing era and then when Charlie Parker plays you can hear that even this early in 1940 he was already on to something different with his playing louder and funnier play that thing louder and funnier
Okay, so I don't know if you could hear it, but that was like way different than anyone else was playing back then. And I will tell you, if you listen to enough Charlie Parker, you'll just know him immediately when you hear him. That's really the mark of a great jazz musician. Uh, Thelonious Monk is another musician that when you hear him, you will know that that's who you're listening to. But I think we'll take a break and we will uh, talk about him and then get into the 50s for the last hour or so. So let's take 10.
Okay, I think we're about ready to start. So, should have used this one. Um, yeah, I had someone ask me about the origin of the word scat. And I just thought that it was um, just kind of one of the nonsense syllables that, that like came up when people sang that way. And that, what just little research I did on the internet seems to say, yeah, probably that's what it means. It could, it also meant to move in a hurry, like um, you you would you would tell someone to, to scat or scatter. So um, I don't know if I have an exact answer to that, but. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about Thelonious Monk. There were several musicians of the bebop era. Charlie Parker did not survive too long into the 50s, but a lot of the bebop musicians did. Um, and some of, some of them were really brilliant. Thelonious Monk is one of them. Um, he's a piano player, and he's really known for his compositions. They are extremely quirky, and a lot of them are extremely hard to improvise over because his chords are kind of off the wall. He was one of the main experimenters in bebop. Um, he's important because when bebop was being formulated, a lot of it was being done in these small after hours clubs in New York. So you get done with your gig and you would go to one of these clubs and you would uh, just jam all night. And Thelonious Monk was the house pianist at one of the most important meeting places. It was called Minton's Playhouse. 
uh, back in the day. So what I wanted to do was um, play a song for you. Actually, since for an in interest of time, I'm going to skip this one. I'm, we're going to do Trinkle Tinkle. And I'm going to play this one for you. And then we're going to watch a video of his group playing one of his most important compositions called Round Midnight. So first of all, uh, here's Thelonious Monk. By the way, I named my cat after him. My cat is named Thelonious. And he does love music. Like when my wife plays piano, he'll sit on top of the piano and just chill out. So anyway, here it is. Okay, so um, I don't know what your impression is of that. Uh, when I, I guess when I first heard him, I just thought he was kind of weird. That's some odd music. And it's interesting that when you think of bebop music, you think of this real kind of technical high speed playing and these long melodic lines. Well, he was one of the important creators of bebop mostly in his chord voicing and things but his style is almost a little clunky um and lots of like sharp dissonances and, and things when he plays um but he wrote so many interesting jazz compositions and in fact that's really what he's known for he 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 had a fairly long career but he most of the music he recorded even later in life was just the songs that he wrote back in the 40s and 50s. He didn't write too many songs after that. He just kind of kept re-recording them with new people. And he's really interesting to watch play, which is why I would like, if we can, I would like to play um, a video of him performing in Europe in the 60s. And yes, this is it. Thank you. 
Yeah. So the video is a little jittery there, but maybe you saw like he has a really odd style with the way he plays. He's almost always flat fingered when he plays. Yep. And he kind of pounds and occasionally there were even some points where he would just throw his forearm onto the keyboard just to get a, a crazy clustered effect. Um, yeah, Glenn Gould would would not have been happy. Well, who knows? Maybe he would have been. But, um, yeah, I really like him a lot. So we're going to end with a talk about the 50s. And if someone were to come up to me on a gig and say, what style of jazz do you play? This is probably what it's going to be. Um, for sure... There are some things from the 60s that you would all often hear a combo playing, bossa nova being one of the, the main things. But the, the 50s are an interesting period because up until then, although there's certainly some fluidity, you could almost look at jazz as being monolithic at any given time period. So, for example... In the early days of jazz, you had the New Orleans style. That gradually morphed into the Chicago style that, that was popular. At the same time, New York big band was happening. And then eventually all of that uh, became the swing style. And the swing style uh, also had some interesting things happening because it was sort of a mishmash of New York and then later in the 30s, an infusion from Kansas City. But the 50s kind of blew all of that out of the water. Uh, in fact, a lot of jazz history books have called this period a period of fragmentation, where a bunch of different genres started to happen, and none of them were particularly dominant. You could kind of just take your pick from whatever was out there. And uh, let me give them to you, and then we will talk a little bit about them. So, first of all, you had what's called trad jazz, short for traditional. And that's basically the New Orleans style redone. Because there were so many people that thought that bebop was a step too far that they wanted to return to the early days of jazz. And I'm really glad they did because um, you can now find video on YouTube of uh, some of these original New Orleans and Chicago players that in the 50s were now being recorded because it, their music had become popular again. So some of these people, um, I'm thinking of like the clarinetist Pee Wee Russell in particular, uh, who we never would have seen a video of had not traditional jazz come back we now got to see some other things that happen we have cool jazz it's sometimes called west coast jazz we'll talk about that in a moment we have third stream jazz which is sort of a mixture of classical music and jazz we have hard bop which is sort of a more uh it's a lot like bebop but it's more of an attempt to make to, to sell bebop a little more, make it a little more popular. There's something called modal jazz that we'll talk about. There's something that's called free jazz that we'll talk about a little bit. So the first thing I want to talk about is cool jazz. And um, one of the important originators of this form was Miles Davis. And Miles Davis is super important his uh probably his first important recordings were made during the late 40s with Charlie Parker but he went on to on his own and basically had his hand in about every style of jazz that would come for the next 3 or 4 decades he was one of the originators of cool jazz he was certainly one of the main people in the hard bop idiom he recorded uh, a few different successful records that blended classical music with jazz, third stream music. Um, he was one of the originators of modal music. And then when you get into the 60s and the 70s, um, he became responsible for a type of music called post-bop. 
and he was one of the first people that would adopt electric bass, electric keyboards into his bands, and he was influenced by James Brown and Jimi Hendrix, and he would create jazz rock fusion. Uh, he would even like run his trumpet through a wah-wah pedal and guitar effects to get different things. But we're talking about cool jazz. So let's listen to this. This is from the famous 1949 recording called Birth of the Cool, which this is one of the reasons it's called cool jazz. And cool jazz is sort of the other side of bebop, where bebop is very fiery and lots of notes. Um, cool jazz is a lot more laid back and a lot more interested in, in interesting orchestrations. At, at times, it almost ventures into sort of a classical jazz fusion. So let's listen to this. <laughs> That's great. Um, Birth of the Cool, those recordings are definitely worth a listen. This group was kind of interesting because it was basically uh, uh, Miles Davis and this guy, Gil Evans, who was the arranger of this particular song. They were just kind of getting together and they started putting rehearsals together in Gil Evans' basement. Miles Davis would go out and do the footwork to get the recordings uh, so they could get a record deal. Uh, they had a couple of recording sessions and I think they played like one gig and that was the end of this group, but it's a really interesting group. Look at the instrumentation, like how they have French horn and tuba in it along with the jazz instruments and very chill. And that's kind of one of the things about cool jazz. Now this recording was made in New York 
but where cool jazz really had an impact was uh, this guy, Jerry Mulligan, who is the baritone saxophonist on these recordings. And also he would arrange some of the music. He went out to the West coast and cool jazz sort of took root and in California and places like that. And that's why cool jazz is also known as West coast. I'd like to play this short song um, by the Jerry Mulligan Chet Baker Quartet. Um, Chet Baker is also a famous jazz vocalist, if you don't know that, besides being a trumpet player. And to me, this song is like a really good example of cool jazz. <laughs> that was chilled out and it's not like west coast musicians couldn't play with some vim and vigor but this was kind of a characteristic sound for them and the soloing i can tell you from my perspective is all from the bebop language but it's different now it's understated it's played at a lower volume there's maybe a little less interaction with the rhythm section um, another important West Coast group was the Mo Modern Jazz Quartet. Um, this band actually came out of Dizzy Gillespie's big band, and they were interested in kind of trying to take um, classical ideas and writing jazz music. And, and in fact, the Modern Jazz Quartet is often referred to as chamber jazz. So this is a very famous uh, jazz standard by Jerome Kern called All the Things You Are. And um, notice the interesting instrumentation here, piano, vibraphone, bass, and drums. So let's give this a listen. Thank you. 
So also highly chilled out, but also very highly arranged. I mean, this is like big band arrangement, really, other than the vibraphone solo in the middle. Like every note almost was probably written out and thought of ahead of time. Um, this is really a, a band to check out if you like that song. Uh, John Lewis, the piano player, and Kenny Clark, the drummer, were both on the uh, Birth of the Cool sessions, the Miles Davis recording. Okay, hard bop. So this is sort of an extension of bebop. It was an attempt to make bebop a little more accessible. It's more highly arranged than bebop is, maybe not so highly arranged as the modern jazz quartet. Um, one of the things that is kind of interesting with hard bop is that now you're seeing more of an uh, infusion of blues, funk, and gospel music. And the bands would play kind of a mixture of like bebop influence, straight ahead jazz, and sometimes it was original music. They played a lot of standards as well but then they would kind of throw in some of this other stuff. And so I would like to play a short piece called The Preacher by the Horace Silver Quintet. There's Horace Silver. And um, his band with the drummer, Art Blakey, is called the Jazz Messengers. And that band, uh, Horace Silver would leave it, but Art Blakey would be the main person that would keep it going. And he had this propensity for getting young up-and-coming jazz musicians to play in his bands and then they would get really good and they would leave and have amazing solo careers afterwards and then he would just wash and repeat if you know who Wynton Marsalis is he got his start in a later version of the jazz messengers so listen to this because this is something new that you haven't heard in jazz well I mean up to now <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so some funk, some blues, but uh, then you had like just straight ahead swinging for the solos. So that is part of what hard bop is. Um, I think I'm going to have to start being a little more selective. I have so much more music to play for you, but just not enough time. So uh, I want to cover like some of the rest of the high points of the 50s. Um, these records right here, cooking, relaxing, steaming, working. I would highly recommend these to anyone. These are sort of classics of the hard bop era. And um, Miles Davis's first great quintet recorded these. He had many great quintets. His second great quintet was in the 60s. Then he even had a quintet that's now been dubbed the Lost Quintet because they never recorded any studio albums. They just toured. Um, this has Miles Davis on trumpet, John Coltrane, who had become one of the most important influential jazz musicians of all time, and um, a bunch of others. Um, let's just listen. We probably won't get through this whole thing, but I'd like to just give you a taste of like what hard bop sounded like when you just played a straight ahead jazz tune. Okay, so I'm sorry to cut that off, but these records to me are kind of a, if you want to know what jazz in the 50s sounded like, these to me are kind of the thing that's closest to where if you go and you hear a gig, this is what you're going to hear. And on those four records are ballads, originals, standards, bebop tunes, 
about everything you want to hear from that period is represented on those. So just a couple of more things. Third Stream was sort of a combination of classical music and jazz. And a lot of musicians were sort of interested in exploring this. So I'd like to play another uh, Miles Davis uh, song. This is Summertime, which comes from Gershwin's um, musical Porgy and Bess. And you can hear how Miles Davis is essentially playing with an orchestra. <laughs> So, lastly, I want to look at the year 1959. And this is regarded as one of the most important years in jazz. There are so many important albums that came out of this time period. And we're not going to get a chance to listen to them all because my eyes were bigger than my stomach. But it's better to have too much material than not enough. And I would say that um, you have these handouts and please go online and listen to these so you can get an idea of what some of these other threads were. Um, here it is. This is probably the best-selling jazz album of all time. It's Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. And um, this might actually be a good point to end. But I will tell you that in 1959, you had the very first free jazz come out, free jazz album come out by Ornette Coleman, which was a music that got actually rid of chord changes. So in other words, you could just play whatever melody popped into your head. So if jazz sounds to you like people just making stuff up as they go along, well, that's probably not a good explanation, but it's kind of an oversimplified explanation of what free jazz is. And that would lead into the avant-garde uh, you also had uh, Charles Mingus come out with uh, the important album, uh, Mingus Ah Um. And he's kind of thought of as being sort of a small group Duke Ellington. His compositions are, are fantastic. You also had Dave Brubeck with his famous album, Take Five. You've probably all heard that song. Um, and then 
the Piano Trio album by Bill Evans, Portrait in Jazz, came out and would revolutionize the idea of how a piano could play in a trio setting with bass and drums. But it was really this album that probably had one of the greatest impacts. And it introduces a style of jazz called modal jazz. And modal jazz is a bit too complex to get into all the technicalities of it. But one implication of it was that instead of improvising on a set of chords that changed every measure or every couple of beats, you would now stay on a chord that could last for maybe an entire eight bar section. And this totally changed the way jazz musicians played because if you're just playing one chord, then you don't really have to think so hard in one way, but in another way, you do have to think really hard because what are you going to do to make things interesting if you only have one chord to improvise over? And in a way, maybe this, among other things, was sort of a reaction to rock music, because in rock music, the chord progressions were very simple as well. So, to end the lecture, I would like to play uh, this song. It's a famous song by So What? It follows normal song form. Eight sections each, A, A, B, A. But the difference is, is that all of the sections are only one chord. So for the A sections, you get a particular minor chord. And then for the B section, if you're listening closely, you're going to hear that same chord, but it's just going to rise slightly in pitch. And then it goes back. So if you haven't heard Kind of Blue... Please go home, pick a rainy day, and put this album on. It is magnificent. This is an introduction. This is the song. We're on the first day. This is the second A. So what? Now listen here. chord just rises in pitch slightly. Then it goes back down. And then we're at the top of the form. Beginning. 
devices again. So that's all we have time for, I am afraid. But hopefully you have – my main goal was I wanted you to have some ideas behind what are the components that make up jazz and then to sort of have an overview of the history of jazz. Now, I know that like swing and New Orleans isn't played a lot anymore, but hopefully it's kind of helped you to see how it's evolved into what's probably the most – important era of jazz if you're going out and hearing music which is the jazz of the 50s um, now of course jazz didn't stop there and in fact the 60s and the 70s are, are really some of my favorite recordings of, of jazz music and the 80s were even more interesting and that's when jazz really started to become par part of the educational curriculum in the united states and it's still going on. Not a lot of people listen to it, but there are, are still really interesting uh, artists doing all kinds of things. But I think that's going to be for another time. So I'd like to thank you all. And if you have any questions, I'll still be checking my email for the next few days. And please let me know if you have anything else. Thank you again. And... I hope you listen to lots of jazz.